Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by this. <laughs> hey, 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 don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila. Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. is the next reel everybody i'm pete Wright, and that there is andy nelson hey 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 and we spoil movies tonight in the show we visit the bar courtesy of franco zaffarelli and his 1968 best picture nominee romeo and juliet the world's most enduring love story is the motion picture to be seen forever Romeo and Juliet. Family, young baggage, disobedient wretch. I tell thee what, get thee to church on Thursday or never after look me in the face. No! 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 So we're wrapping up this uh, 1968 thing with this film, this 1968 extravaganza, cinematic extravaganza. And uh, this was our last little mini series talking about 1968, the last film in the last little mini series. Uh, that is this one nominated but did not win best picture 1968 uh how'd you feel when you when you watch this one what'd you think of it okay there's a lot to unpack with your question <laughs> i feel like i need to back up the, the, <laughs> i'm standing too close to the mic exactly the first thing uh to to discuss is taking on shakespeare 
because Shakespeare has never been something that I've loved. It's always a chore. I always really, I try and try to get into it. Um, And I certainly appreciate some of um, uh, some various film versions of Shakespeare. I've seen Shakespeare plays, you know, I mean, everyone encounters Shakespeare all through their lives. And I've I've hit Mm -hmm. quite a number of them. Uh, I certainly wouldn't consider myself a student of Shakespeare. Um, I purposefully avoided any class that was focusing on just Shakespeare because I would lose my (laughs) mind. Um, It is a chore. Um, I can appreciate Shakespeare. Um, There are some Shakespeare plays and uh, adaptations of them that I uh, would watch more than once. Um, But it is not something that I would ever say I am raring to jump into on a moment's notice. So that's the first okay. the first part of your question. Okay. Romeo and Juliet has never been uh, a favorite of mine. I find the the nonsensical uh, lusty relationship between the two youths um uh to be really kind of nothing more than that. This this lusty relationship uh-huh. between naive kids um and I mean, I I get it. I understand, you know, this was kind of Shakespeare stepping away from kind of the the bigger stories that he'd been telling up to that point. You know, the the mm-hmm. stories about kings and and uh, warriors and leaders and all this sort of stuff. This was kind of his chance to tell a story that was um, a little bit closer to the people. To that end, I can appreciate that. Um, but I cannot help but get irritated by the the like the dreamy eyed uh, looks. I mean, it's basically Twilight in Shakespeare days. It's like this this mm-hmm. frustrating love story that's not really. I just have such a hard time buying that it's love. It's like this instant lust, and then they get married and kill themselves. <laughs> just, hmm. It really frustrates hmm. me. Okay. This version is the first <laughs> experience I actually had with Romeo and Juliet. Um, this was the version in high school that uh, when we read it in uh, one of my English classes, then we watched this version um, with all the snickering that we did with um, Juliet's busty display as she leans over the balcony and with Romeo walking around with his butt hanging out. Uh, all of that was ripe for high school uh, jests. And uh, okay, two two things really quick, not yeah. to interrupt. Uh, but uh, Romeo, that you use Romeo's uh, but and the word ripe in the same sentence unintentionally, <laughs> I think is genius. <laughs> and number two, uh, I would just like to say for the record, there is nothing hanging out with that butt. <laughs> no. That butt is a thing of envy. It is a, it a, is a firm 17-year-old butt. A kettle drum <laughs> is what that is. When I say hanging and out, I, I just continue. mean yes. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's uh, uh, He okay. was the one who surely inspired Mel Gibson and George Clooney to yes. start wanting to yes. walk around uh, with their butts with, flapping with in the their wind. Butts. Can I say that instead? <laughs> 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 okay, we're moving in the wrong direction, but sounds good. Keep going. Anyway, um, revisiting this film um, was probably the least, um, uh, I had the least interest of all of the films that we were going to be uh, looking at from 1960, at least of the ones that I had seen. Um, it's just a hard one for me to watch. And so I went into it with trepidation. In the end, I walked out of it saying, it's Romeo and Juliet. Um, I, I don't think I hate it, but it is Romeo and Juliet. And to that end, it still was a struggle. Okay. So l- let me just ask, is there anyone else at your house with whom I could have this conversation? Because so far you're a drag. <laughs> I can get the kids. We can talk about Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> I, you know, I, but I'm, I, uh, on, on some, uh, some level I'm with you. It, it took me three days to do this mostly because I was, you know, it's family vacation and I kept starting it at night and I, I feel like I pulled an Andy over and over and over again. I kept watching it about 15, 20 minutes in, I would fall sound asleep and the whole movie would play and then it, I would wake up and go to bed. And, uh, and so I, I struggled with that. So I started last night with my children. We started watching it. 
And uh, my daughter had just recently seen it uh, in, as you can imagine, her high school. They had read it and then they watched the film and they did all of the snickering and, oh, sure. and all of that. My I'm son, glad to know that high school 12, students still do that. <laughs> they still do that with this You're version right. of the Thank God they don't do Baz Luhrmann's version. Good Lord. Um, they should do the hot so, fuzz version of the Baz Luhrmann version. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Uh, and, and then then my son watched it, too. And he uh, spent the first, I, I think, half hour playing Pokemon Go <laughs> while he was watching the <laughs> film. Uh, but then he, he got into it and it got me thinking uh, about how I judge Shakespeare, because I don't I don't seek out a lot of Shakespeare. But when I do, you know, I, I want to enjoy it. I spent some time in the theater in high school and college and I did some Shakespeare and uh, I was not very good at it. But it 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 helped me sort of formulate the question, the central question that I use to get into movies and plays uh, of Shakespeare's work. And that is how well do the performances in the film help us, the audience, to penetrate the impenetrable language of Shakespeare, right? I mean, it's Here we are 500 years later, and are we able to use these things that aren't language, the non-spoken details of production and performance that let us figure out what is going on, what is subtext, what are they trying to tell us, what's the story they're trying to tell us, and are the characters entertaining and interesting uh, along the ride? And, uh, you know, is it cast well? Are the locations and the settings appropriate? Are those choices appropriate as they that they make with the film? Um, you know, are the script adaptations, you know, are, the, are those appropriate for, for this film in particular? And for me, this one, I think they do a solid job uh, of it. I feel like as I'm watching this, you know, long films, two hours and 19 minutes, you know, 1968, it's got an intermission. Uh, I, I found myself trucking along right with it. And most importantly, I found my kids, my youngest, trucking along right with it, too. And after the, uh, you know, the first big melee in the square, uh, he he was in it and he was watching. He was asking questions, but mostly he was he was in tune with what was going on. So so much so that by the time they the climactic scene in the crypt, um, you know, it the, it was a feeling moment. I mean, it was he, he was he was leaning into it. And I thought that was a really uh, Im important measure for me as to the success and, and how well this film holds up. Is it my favorite of the set of films that we've watched in this series? No. Uh, I, I don't think I was looking forward to it with as much trepidation as you were, but does it hold up as a, a strong presentation of Shakespeare with strong uh, character performances uh, of, you know, Romeo and Juliet and Mercutio and, uh, you know, Tybalt? I, th I thought they were all strong performances, interesting performances. And, um, and, and I did find myself enjoying the ride. And I can appreciate that. I can certainly appreciate that. I mean, it's Shakespeare. I think if you can go into it kind of, you know, uh, stealing yourself for the expectation of the chore of kind of, you know, using your brain really hard to kind of interpret everything as it's getting thrust at you. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I can I can get it it's an interesting one I, I i do think there was a lot of stuff that uh that franco zeffirelli did here that brought the world to life really nicely that i really enjoyed i enjoyed the locations i enjoyed um the way that it felt it felt very uh period you know i think i think the costumes the 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 way everything kind of built this world um did help quite a bit um, I, I, you know, this is kind of silly, but I did keep asking myself is what is going on in Verona? Is it really just like a two family town? Because every time <laughs> it's like the two houses come out, it's like the whole town is full. I'm like, is, is, is really <laughs> the, the Capulets and the, uh, whatever the other family is, the, 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 the Montagues. Montagues. Oh I, dear. Are we there? Uh, no, I just blanked it. But, <laughs> but seriously, it's like, it, where is everybody else in this town? I like I yeah. really <laughs> was struggling. Like, don't they say, would you guys just knock it off already? Like, you know, it's like, like the yeah. prince clearly doesn't care much. <laughs> he kind of prince. comes out and goes, you guys need to knock this off. You know, the prince, and, though, and, is a it, it's oh. a forehead slapping job that he has, which is basically, you know, he knows with every time he comes out on the street, he's like, oh, you guys, please, please. Do I have to get Sheriff Joe in here? Like, really? <laughs> That's what it felt like. This is like frontier Arizona. Uh, it's like everybody has a sword. 
<laughs> the only thing that can protect you from a bad guy with a sword is a good guy with a sword and a sense of humor. And uh, that's that's what it is. That's what Verona is Well, like it's funny. Right it, and it's funny that you mentioned that because that's something that I really felt on this viewing is that this the period that Shakespeare is writing about in Verona here, and we've certainly seen it in plenty of other uh, period films, everybody is walking around with a sword on their hip yes. at the ready. And I mean, it's basically gangs. They I mean, this is like um, a, a modern version. And I think to that end, Baz Luhrmann captured that nicely. Uh, people have guns on their hips and they're ready. Uh, you know, they're 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 young. They're they're um, full of uh, piss and vinegar and anger and at, and they're ready to kind of get into these rumbles at any turn. And it's really, it was kind of interesting to see that it's like, gosh, times really haven't changed because you still have these issues and it's, it's kind of ridiculous how common it is. And it's funny because Roger Ebert in his review of this film, he actually pointed out that, that this version of the film focused on, uh, focused so much more on the love story. And Baz Luhrmann's version focused so much more on the violence. Now, I haven't seen Baz Luhrmann's version in quite a while, but I'm like, there was tons of violence in this one. I mean, you know, start off with this huge sword fight that the two families get into, stabbing each other, mm -hmm. and maybe nobody dies, but certainly people are getting stabbed left and right. And Oh, make no mistake, William Shakespeare is the Michael Bay of 1600. Yeah. It's, like, which is really interesting. everything he does is like yeah. this. It's fascinating. Well, and that's it's really interesting to that end to see how on edge these these stories are and it's funny how a story like this can be looked at as such a classic tale of um kind of uh you know these groups and and uh, just kind of this passion and stuff but you get um people who might you know turn a blind eye to uh, you know other films that we might have talked about on this show that take place uh, between like two rival gangs in the ghetto or something um, but they look at it as, as, as a gang film and they're not going to watch it because it's just not something that they can relate to. I'm like, well, it, this is the exact same thing. And yeah, I think that that's right. a really interesting thing that's telling how one is seemed as a classic, but the other is, is kind of looked down upon where it's, I mean, it's, it's very common. And to that end, Shakespeare, um, is right in line with a lot of, uh, modern storytellers telling these types of stories. And that's why certain films like West Side Story, uh, as much as I don't like that one, and uh, and Baz Luhrmann's version work really well because mm -hmm. it is pointing those elements out. Yeah, I, I think so. And and I think that when you take all of those elements and you put them in, you know, these stage performances that have sort of, you know, stayed with us of Shakespeare's works and, and works attributed to Shakespeare of the time they they become sort of overwrought sort of uh, you know these the, they become much bigger uh than they you know than than maybe the stories themselves would have been and i have to be a little easier on the story and shakespeare um when i complain about um that instant love that happens in his story here when as soon as shakespeare right. or so, sorry as soon as romeo and juliet see each other it's like instant love and yes, it's it's easy for me uh, because I just don't like it as much to dismiss it as teenage lust because, I mean, that's essentially what it is. But that's not being fair to a very common trope in in storytelling in Shakespeare's day and certainly still to this day where that is a, a very common way to have people kind of connect and um, and fall in love uh, because it really just, I mean, it moves the story along at a much quicker pace. And so it's, it's kind of an essential part of love stories. So I have to at least mm -hmm. acknowledge that I can't be. Yeah. I, I, well, I mean, yeah. Uh, fall, fall in love in an elevator, fall in love. I mean, people do this. It happens all the time. And I think, I think you're, I think that's a really appropriate admission uh, uh, for you. I think you are a noble gentleman uh, of podcasts to be able to say. Well, that. I feel like we've uh, talked about think that's that unfair. same trope in other films that we've discussed yeah. on the show, and I don't have a problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, exactly. No. Yeah, um, I I have a problem, uh, but I I also have a problem with with um, you know being too hard on the instant relationship thing because I think you know if 
if we're being too critical of it, uh, you know, we're we're probably being too critical of it with a contemporary eye. And um, you know, there are so many cultural elements that that make that a danger. Uh, and and so you know we we have to shed that baggage before we look at this this film, um, you know, and see does it if if we look at it through the air of the time through the air of the gestalt of like these archetypes, right? What are the what are the archetypes of of love and romance, and does this film present one that is that transcends, um, you know, the the baggage that comes with relationships of of our modern society i think the film works i think the story works i think it's why it holds up so well and and uh, over time and why so many uh, films uh take on this many hundreds of years old trope now of of instant love true love and uh forbidden love uh and and try to tell that story in their own way i i think it's i think it's fine you're right it that? is i mean for all i know this is kind of where a lot of that originated anyway you know i i honestly am not quite sure where kind of that instant love type of storytelling began but for all i know shakespeare did invent it with this film who knows what do you think though of the ca- i want to go back to the casting though i i, I want to go back to the casting though because that's that's part of sort of my central thesis of approaching shakespeare does the does the cast and do the performances help you uh keep in touch with what is going on here these are a lot of very young actors you know there's right they're all in their 15 16 17 18 maybe early 20s uh doing shakespeare in italy um how well do you think uh, they handled the work. Did you buy it? Did it? Did that sort of did the melodra- melodramatic sort of approach to these characters, you know, work for you? Uh, you know, uh, I appreciate that uh, Zeffirelli really wanted to cast this with actors who were much closer to the age of the characters in the play. Um, I mean, they were both a little older, technically, uh, as it's written, Juliet is like a 13 year old girl, almost 14. Romeo, I think is a year older. Um, so, I mean, they're very, very young now, granted people were also marrying their kids off at this age. So it's, you know, right. to that end, I do have to keep that in mind as this is, as this is happening, uh, as I consider my 12 year old daughter, uh, you know acting this out uh which, which just oh, horrifies yeah. me to my think about. my 16 year old's already a spinster yeah right exactly um i i think there's a lot i i think that actually helps quite a bit um i i think that uh olivia hussey and leonard whiting um bring some of that doe-eyed innocence to the roles that helps it kind of gives a sense of that uh you know they they haven't been broken by the world yet and uh mm-hmm. although they will be by the end of the film um but it's it's nice to see and I, to that end when i'm seeing moments like the balcony scene um i really feel like there is a connection there now granted i think a lot of that is still that teenage lust but i do think that these um these actors kind of keep that uh keep the focus on i guess the kind of the the um the kind of that the um the passion of kind of just that that excitement of first love i i think that's one of the things that works really well for me it's certainly one of the things that made this film popular at the time with with teens yeah, with the youths. right that this this film was super popular with teens because it it you know cast people that looked like them that felt like them that were exploring you know um, emotions like them and i think that's one of the one of the angles of the story that makes it so interesting when you think of these kids and and back to this conversation about you know guns and kids who are making choices about their future without thinking about them right these emotional choices that come out i think that's that's one of the things that works for me in the story of romeo and juliet that you know the adults have enabled them by giving them swords and giving them access to you know the the friar who gives them poison right that that uh they are enabled to make questions in the split second that determine the nature of the rest of their lives their very short lives and and um that culture has put them in a position of being able to make those choices and having to make those choices uh, about their futures is one of the elements that's worth 
I think, thinking about uh, and, and, you know, processing as you watch this movie, because I think that's one of the lessons that comes out of it. Right. That's a big uh, issue, um, you know, that Romeo and Juliet is trying to confront. And I, I think it does it well. I think these I think these kids, you know, they uh, their Shakespearean was passable. I thought it was good. I thought they they did a, a fine job of not getting tongue tied. Uh, I I do know that they had to make some uh, significant changes to the the script to reduce some of the long speeches that they were that they uh, struggled with with some of the young actors and and you could feel that the pacing was a little bit uh, was was a little bit peppy compared to. Uh, the the original, but uh, overall, I think they did a fine job. And it's interesting to watch these kids do it on screen here. It's interesting to to watch the the sort of production design. That's one of the things that I I really like about this. I like the uh, that it feels like a, a small you know city Verona. Uh, I, I like the the where they set it. I like the uh, the look of it. Although I have to say, uh, after watching the line in winter i i kept sort of wanting more grit i would like to see this you know this story set a little bit more authentically um you know this feels very much like a uh, postcard shakespeare um it's yeah it felt clean yeah it's very very clean and and um so i'm i'm sort of yearning for a, another adaptation that really sort of digs into it i I don't know if I'd want to see anything closer to the original. Uh, you know, the the rule of thumb for Shakespeare is that, um, you know, it's the, the play uh, is about a thousand lines an hour. Right. And and Romeo and Juliet, the original was about three thousand thirty one hundred lines. Um, so to see the the play as it was written. And there are so many different versions that have been sort of reinterpreted. But to see the play as is written, it's it's on the three hour mark. I don't know that I would want to see one of those uh, on on film. That uh, there there are a lot of little characters that get cut, uh, cut for time, cut for pacing. And I think this one actually feels about right. It feels like a pretty good mix of of the right cuts um, from the play. Uh, yeah, it's hard for me to say, um, just because I've never seen the actual full version of the play. Um, but I feel like to that end, what I know about um, the, I, I take that back. I mean, we read the play in, in yes. high school. So I, I know I have my high school brain understanding of the play, which uh, yep. you know may not be that great. It's probably closer to the cliff notes version, but I still feel like they captured the key moments, like the balcony scene. I felt like they captured that, uh, at least the essence of it. Same thing with the crypt scene. Um, there are certain points where I felt feel like uh, even if they did truncate it, I felt like they were still capturing mm -hmm. the essence of it. Well, and the big deaths too. I mean, Mercutio's death uh, is is a great one. You know, a pox on all your houses. I think is a great scene, and I think he does a fantastic job um, delivering it. Um, this is John McHenry, and um, clearly John McHenry, is somebody who has. Um, you know, has a strength in Shakespeare. I mean, it just he felt very natural. Uh, you know, the sequence that he has with Tybalt in the in the where he's in the fountain, I, I think really highlights a lot of the Shakespearean sort of comedy in these conversations back and forth. And I think it, it really works well. And I got some nice chuckles out of that. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Tybalt was uh, equally terrific and and just a, a I, I think a powerful performance from a very young Michael York. What is up with that? Right. Uh, seeing him in this in this movie, I'd um, I had forgotten that he didn't look like himself at all. Uh, but man, as soon as he opened his mouth. Yeah. Uh, all, I, all I could hear was basal exposition. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. This so, is awfully close fun. to um, Cabaret, which came out in 71, yep. Yep. two, two. two. So mm -hmm. um, uh, he didn't look that different from from that period so i i you mm -hmm. know I, I i kind of pinned him closer to that one it had a couple faces not a ton that i recognized but his his and uh milo o'Shea who played friar lawrence um friar, I, yeah. I just recognized I, he's one of those faces that i'm like i know i recognize you but from where and of course he was the verdict uh he was the judge in the verdict yeah. the other one that i struggled with was pat haywood who played the nurse why is she so familiar to me andy oh I don't know. 
it it, I, it the whole time I'm searching for I look at her credits and everything in there I can I I don't think I've seen but my goodness it feels like she is somebody that I've seen in a lot of other stuff she's I I guess I just sort of write her off as one of those faces but uh her voice the way her mouth moves it was so familiar to me um that I'm I'm really struggling on this one what what has she done that would be so deeply buried in my you know cinema subconscious I don't know there's nothing in her uh, filmography that registers with me so i think it's just one of yep. those kind of that that body uh kind of earthy nurse performance that i think just makes it feel recognizable uh and, and of course leonard whiting and, and olivia hussey as romeo and juliet are title characters wow uh leonard whiting uh fell off the map yeah he you know it's uh yeah i mean i didn't i wasn't as impressed with him as i was with uh, olivia hussey i mean i thought he was fine but i can see why maybe he fell off the map he uh did yeah. not do much beyond this he acted uh for really kind of less than a decade in uh mm -hmm. film and tv um and that was pretty much it i don't know about his his life on stage but uh yeah i guess he's just one of those guys where it just was not in the cards or just he wasn't interested in kind of continuing a career um, doing that sort of thing. Which I think is so funny. He uh, So he was on stage quite a bit before uh, he was. They found him. He had played the Artful Dodger for a year and a half or so uh, when he was, you know, 12 or 13 in London. He was on, in the National Theater. He went on tour. Uh, and uh, that's kind of how they plucked him up for this. But you watch like you watch him in the behind the scenes stuff. Um, and he's like he's every bit the young Johnny Depp. You know what I mean? Like that sort of character. Um, and I, I I just I can't figure out why he didn't take off. And so many other did, others, you know, who looked exactly like him and had that same kind of cool guy shtick uh, made yeah. it because I mean, he, he did a few things you know, and, you know, was in a voice in some animated stuff in the 90s, yeah. uh, but really largely did not do much. There's a, a really wonderful meta kind of interview uh, that these two did, uh, you know, on the press tour. And one of the questions the interviewer asks is, are you worried, um, you know, because so many great actors and actresses have done Shakespeare and then gone on to nothing else? You know, they've just disappeared. Are you worried about that happening to you? And this is, of course, after they filmed this this thing and it's about to be released. And they're saying, you know, it's funny to hear him say, uh, yeah, I really am. I really, really am. I have no idea what I want to do next, <laughs> um, but I'm really nervous about picking the right project. And then he goes on to completely disappear. Right. Uh, it, it's it's uh, just it's sad. That uh, pulls at the old heartstrings. And then, of course, Olivia Hussey, um, she had been on stage uh, before as well. She'd done uh, about two years of The Pride of Miss Jean Brody on stage with Nessa Redgrave. And so she, she'd she been on stage with a lot. And then she did this thing. And then she started to struggle a, a little bit and i don't know if we talked about this part of her life when she when we did uh, black christmas she was in black christmas and uh, uh some years later what was that 1970 is that another 72 uh black christmas 74 uh, 74 uh she did black christmas that was our holiday film last year that we talked about and she was you know she was great that was a a, a fun <laughs> fun little romp uh, uh that she did which was a, a very strange follow-up to this so then she goes on and she uh, finds her way back to the States and uh, not back to the States. She's she finds her way to the States and she uh, ends up living with Christopher Jones in a relationship with him. And he uh, has some it sounds like some real trouble, um, psychological trouble, drug trouble. He ends up uh, physically abusing her and raping her. And she just has this terrible thing. She moves into uh, Sharon Tate's house in in Los Angeles. Uh, Sharon Tate, of course, uh, was. And that was the big Manson murder. She moves into that house a month after the the murders uh, take place. And that's where she is um, abused and, and raped by uh, Chris. I mean, she just had she had a rough time immediately after this movie. This the following decade was just really tough on her. And so, um, you know, I I found her performance in here as such a young actress, uh, really captivating. And, I you know, it's sad that she didn't have a, kind of a more robust career uh, after this film, because I think her performance here, you know, merits more attention 
Um, but, um, you know, that that next decade really sort of put a stake in it. Well, the film, I mean, you know, this is what happens when you cast a really young actress is uh, it's a yeah. difficult it's a very difficult profession for young people. She was uh, initially uh, Zeffirelli didn't want to cast her because he said she was too um, too plump. And then once he did cast her, he still uh, said that she was too full figured. And he apparently said no more pasta will be served on set. You know, he and, and so, I mean, that's the sort of thing that gives a person um, issues. Right. And after yeah, this movie yeah. came out, she actually quit acting for several years um, because she was suffering from agoraphobia. And it did take her a while to kind of get herself um, back into the swing of things. And um, and I know that, uh, you know, she's gone on to I don't remember reading about that stuff that you were talking about, but I know she certainly uh, dealt with other issues as far as uh, her uh, her ex-husband getting killed in a plane crash and, uh, you know, just Things like that that she yeah, dealt with. Yeah, she was she was married to uh, Dean Paul Martin, right. Dean Martin's son. Yeah, right. uh, Dino, yeah, that and uh, uh, she's now been married for twenty seven years to uh, uh, Isley, uh, David Isley, and uh, it sounds like things are are great. Their daughter, uh, India Isley, is also an actress and model, and uh, in, in fact, they were in they both uh, Hussey and uh, Leonard Whiting played. Uh, India Isley's parents in the film Social Suicide, uh, which is loosely based on Romeo and Juliet. It does. Uh, Social Suicide does not uh, jump uh, above the IMDb six star uh, <laughs> review limit. So, you know, watch the trailer and see what you think. But, um, you know, to your point about Zeffirelli and and his sort of, you know, the way she talks about him in, you know, to see her writing about him in, in her memoir, um, you know, she talks about him as a genius. You know, he gets he casts the right people. He lets them do what what they need to do. At the same time, she has these stories about him, you know, putting her in this, you know, this bustier to really accentuate teen cleavage and call her nickname on set was boobs omina um it, which is just like what what are you doing to this child right uh so yeah all the pieces start to fall into place you know it's it's kind of gross it's interesting looking at who other options were that zeffirelli was considering apparently he'd considered uh, paul mccartney to play romeo um and yeah. Paul McCartney talks about it, um, including meeting Olivia Hussey and stuff like that. And then for uh, for the role of Juliet, before Hussey was considered, he actually considered Angelica Houston. Uh, but John Houston wrote a letter to Zeffirelli saying he, uh, he had already committed her to work on his film, A Walk with Love and Death. And apparently Angelica was quite bothered by that because I think she would rather have done this one. But mm -hmm. who knows? Also, I think it's interesting. There's a, a apparently it's an urban legend, but uh, the story had gone that Olivia Hussey was not allowed to actually go to the premiere of the film because uh, she wasn't allowed to see films with nudity, even though the nudity in the film was her own. Now, apparently it is an urban right. legend, but it does make for a fun story. <laughs> it, it reminds me of, you know, eighth grade uh, or, you know, Deadpool, where the the I can't remember the the kid's name who was in that other fantastic movie anyway he was in deadpool yeah. 2 and he couldn't he wasn't allowed to go see his own movie uh, because <laughs> right. it was uh, uh great yeah. stories great stories uh, so we mentioned john mchenry and uh, milo o'shea and pat haywood and uh, michael york fantastic as tybalt uh uh then we have to uh, to get to benvolio bruce robinson as benvolio and he wrote and directed one of my favorite weird movies uh, that I'm so excited he to see him in this movie as such a weird uh, little character. <laughs> Which is funny because, uh, yeah, I've never seen With Nail and I, um, but he did write and direct that one. And yeah. uh, it is interesting because after acting, he kind of, um, I mean, he I think he continued acting, but he really started working on screenwriting. Actually, he earned an Oscar nomination for writing The Killing Fields, which is a pretty powerful film. And then he yes. wrote and directed with Nail and I, and apparently the character Uncle Monty, he based it on uh, Franco Zeffirelli, who apparently pursued and attempted to woo him through the whole making of Romeo and Juliet, which is 
really quite funny. A great gift in Uncle Monty <laughs> that he gives us that character, <laughs> Zeffirelli. Really I good. really need to watch that movie. But Bruce Robinson did direct um, How to Get Ahead in Advertising, which is a film I do adore greatly. Very funny movie. Fantastic contributions. Lawrence Olivier is uncredited, but he uh, comes in with his uh, voiceover as the narrator and Lord Montague uh, was uh, ADR as Lord Montague in this film. Apparently, the, uh, did the you actor notice? did not do well enough, and so uh, uh, yeah. Olivier got to do that. I didn't notice that it was Olivier, but I did think it was funny. We've brought up several times throughout uh, all of these films we've been talking about from the 60s, this other film, The Shoes of the Fisherman, which we have neither of us have seen, but it... Um, it beat some of the films that we've talked about in the award ceremonies. And uh, Laurence Olivier was in Rome filming that film. And that's when he uh, was talking to Zeffirelli and Zeffirelli said, hey, can you record these lines? So that's kind of the reason that Olivier ended up uh, doing all of that. I did not notice it either when I heard his voice. I had to go back and listen to the opening again the, and uh, uh, see if I could figure it out. I, I still didn't. I knew it was Olivier and I couldn't tell it was Olivier. Yeah. Italian Pascolino de Santis is behind the camera on this one. I don't think I've seen anything else that Pascolino de Santis has uh, shot. Um, uh, what do you think of his work behind the camera here? There were, for the most part, I thought it was actually, it, it felt nice as a part of the world. Um, there were a few times where I felt like I was catching um, elements of 60s cinematography, some of the, the handheld uh, way they were kind of catching a moment or just kind of particularly in the brawls yeah right? the exactly brawls exactly funky um uh, and I, I think that to me kind of stood out as a, oh this is kind of a 60s moment here um but for the most part i just thought it didn't stand out as anything um uh too uh in the way of the film i thought it actually just captured the world nicely I do too. Uh, the thing I like most about his work here is actually not his work here. It's the year. It, it's the film he did immediately after this, and as an Italian cinematographer, after Romeo and Juliet, where it's this this thing about lust and teen hormones and all this. The next year is titled almost in in a sense like it's giving up. It is <laughs> listen, let's make love, and I find that hysterical. <laughs> listen, get it over with. <laughs> Let's make love. We're all Italians here. That's great. Oh, stereotypes are delicious. So funny. Uh, we got to talk about the music before we wrap up here. The music is, I think we'll agree, uh, mostly because of the length of the notes that you put in our show notes here, <laughs> uh, that we'll agree that the music is transcendent, the score from Nino Rota. This uh, has always been just one of Nino Rota's standout scores. Uh, there's such amazing tragedy and romance in the the theme uh it just it fits perfectly for the story being told and i'm amazed that it captures it so well you listen to it one time and it's just like this sumptuous romantic uh, music and then you listen to the same track again and it's like oh my god my heart is breaking because it's so tragic it works so brilliantly both ways and i am just endlessly impressed with what rhoda does here um and what's interesting is the love theme and I had forgotten this, but it, there is a lyrics version that is sung in the film, and it is called What is Youth? Um, it's not my favorite thing to listen to. Um, I prefer listening to... Yeah, it's in the square, right? Yes. When the when the guy in the in the blue outfit comes and everybody's listening. Yes, that's, right, right. That's where they first touch, yeah, right? Yeah, right, which is a great scene. Yeah. I love the, the hands. It's a great scene. Um, yeah. Uh, I, but I, the song itself, I'm like, eh, you know, I guess it works. It's kind of... Um, it fits in context of, of Shakespeare, uh, as it, it feels a part of the world, but I just don't, I don't love that. Um, however, um, the other instrumental versions, like it turned into this hugely popular thing. Like Henry Mancini did a version that was a very successful one, um, the following year. Um, there was another version of the song or, or sorry, another version of lyrics written for the tune. And it, it was written as a, a song called A Time For Us. Uh, Larry Cusick and Eddie Snyder wrote the lyrics. And this song has been recorded by Johnny Mathis and Andy Williams. And then there's an Italian translation version of it that uh, Josh Groban has performed and uh, just a bunch of people. It's it's a very interesting. Oh, and then there's a third version called I Giochi Adio. I don't know if I'm saying that right, 
but it's one that a lot of opera singers have performed. So it's interesting to me that this passionate theme has been so inspirational to so many different writers. I, it, for, as far as I know, it may be the only piece of of instrumental music that has kind of created three different songs written from it, essentially. It's, it's amazing. You know, you say passionate theme. I say hell of an earworm, too. <laughs> if you can't, if you can listen to it and not start singing it uh, a la Pavarotti afterwards, and you're doing it wrong. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, there's another little spinoff uh, from uh, the music, though, that uh, might be a little bit more resonant in pop culture. Yeah, I guess you could say that. Uh, Tom York uh, from Radiohead, he uh, says that he was inspired by this film, their, their song Exit Music for a Film, um, which they specifically wrote for the ending credits of Baz Luhrmann's version. Um, he uh, York has said, I saw the Zeffirelli version when I was 13 and I cried my eyes out because I couldn't understand why the morning after they shagged, they didn't just run away. The song is written for two people who should run away before all the bad stuff starts. A personal song. I think that's hilarious. <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, and of course, just to highlight that the MPAA uh, is not the only completely broken ratings system in the world yeah you know, we have this little bit right of the, the brits have their own issues uh it was the first shakespearean movie that received a classification other than you which for british censors is an all ages it's like the g here in the states before this every adaptation from shakespeare uh shakespeare's works automatically was given to you but they changed their minds with this one due to the nudity and the crypt scene overwrought my goodness so sad. How did it do an award season? Well, uh, I mean, this is a uh, it's Shakespeare and it's popular uh, and it hit at the right time. You know, as you mentioned, uh, this was the 60s. It was a time of uh, political upheaval. And this story of these star crossed lovers really captured the minds of kind of the rebellious youth that were tired of uh, all the old people and what old people were doing to the world. So it ended up really getting received quite well. 16 wins, 15 other nominations. Over at the Oscars, it did win for Best Cinematography and Best Costume Design. Uh, we already mentioned Best Picture, it lost to Oliver, and Best Director uh, also lost to Oliver. Apparently this was, and I think it's still true to this day, the last Shakespearean film to be nominated for Best Picture, uh, which is, uh, I guess, there certainly have been plenty of adaptations. I guess none of them have kind of connected with the culture quite as strongly. Um, over at the Golden Globes, this was interesting. They had a category at the time of the Golden Globes called Best English Language Foreign Film. And I guess it's because this was an Italian-UK production. Granted, it was in English, but that's hence the category. It did win wow. for best uh, uh, for Best English Language Foreign Film. Also, uh, Hussey won for Best Promising Female Newcomer and Whiting won for Best Promising Male Newcomer. Um, that was an auspicious award given their careers. Yeah, right, right. Um, uh, Zeffirelli lost Best Director to Paul Newman for Rachel Rachel. And as I mentioned earlier, The Shoes of the Fisherman, uh, that took the score uh, award away from uh, Nino Rota. Alex North got that one. Um, over in Italy, the David D. Donatello Awards at one Best Director and Best Performances for Hussey and Whiting and the Italian National Syndicate of Film Journalists. It just kind of swept uh, swept clean at one Director, Color Cinematography, Costume Design, Score and Production Design. How to do it in the box office? Well, as, uh, this adaptation of Shakespeare's uh, tragic love story cost eight hundred fifty thousand to make, which is about five point nine million in today's dollars, which is pretty cheap for a period picture, actually. Yeah. Uh, the movie was released October eighth, nineteen sixty eight, opposite Finian's Rainbow, I Love You, Alice B. Toklas, and Barbarella. It was the most financially successful adaptation of one of Shakespeare's plays at the time, largely due to its popularity with teens, as we said, raking in $38.9 million at the box office, or about $269.2 million in today's dollars. That put the film in the sixth spot for top-grossing films from the year, and meant the movie walked away with an adjusted profit per finished minute of $1.9 million. On profit-to-cost ratio, it made 45 times its budget. That lands it in the sixth spot for the most profitable films we've talked about on the show, Behind Mad Max, Night of the Living Dead, Gone with the Wind, E.T., and A Fistful of Dollars. 
I'd say that's a pretty solid run for the old bard. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I'd say that's a solid run. That's not a bad, uh, not not bad company from a, a profitability standpoint. We started talking about uh, the films of 1968 with 2001, the bottom half of last year. That's a lot of films we've talked about on this show uh, in this particular year. And I'm curious now that we've been through it. Uh, starting with 2001 and Planet of the Apes and Targets and Coogan's Bluff and The Detective and Danger Diabolic and uh, Night of the Living Dead kicked off our Dead trilogy. And then Once Upon a Time in the West one, uh, and uh, let's see, Thomas Crown Affair and the producers for our uh, movies and their remakes. And then, of course, all of the 1968 Best Picture nominees. Uh, what do you feel like you have learned about 1968, Andy? And uh, what are you taking away from this uh, survey? Well, and you, I think we should just also mention um, in previous years, we've talked about Funny Girl and Bullet, two other films from true, 1968. True. Keep those on the yeah. list, right? I... Uh, it's it's interesting looking at the films overall from 1968, and in this particular series, um, the films nominated for Best Picture. I think of the films nominated for Best Picture, which were uh, Funny Girl, uh, Rachel, Rachel, Oliver, Lion in Winter, and Romeo and Juliet. I feel like, um, <laughs> I feel like maybe one of those I would nominate. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's it's funny how they might be resonant at the time. And I think that's I mean honestly that is I think largely what Oscars are for. They are something that is meant to kind of reflect kind of what is going on at the time. And they aren't necessarily meant to reflect the films that are going to stand out as um the ones that last uh, for decades that people are still talking about, like 2001, like Planet of the Apes, um, Night of the Living Dead even. Those films, I would say, are much more important cultural milestones now than they were at the time. And uh, But I can see why a film like Romeo and Juliet would get recognized, because it did strike a chord with people. Um, I struggle a little bit with Rachel Rachel, why it got nominated. But again, I think it's relating to the people involved paul newman uh, and uh, rachel wood joanne woodward certainly i think are two people that would um in acting circles lead to get a push for that to get a nomination if it were up to me though i would put the producers planet of the apes 2001 absolutely um <laughs> i probably would still put lion in winter on there that might be the one i would keep and, you know, I know it's very uh, genre heavy already with what I'm picking, but I would probably either put Once Upon a Time in the West, Night of the Living Dead or Targets in there as my fifth choice. Yeah, for me, Targets um, and Once Upon a Time in the West are in there. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm I, Oliver is out. Rachel Rachel is out. Uh, and Romeo and Juliet and Lion in Winter uh, stick around. Producers is in too. I that's I, I just feel like that's more of a of an interesting survey of 1968. And um, if you know if we're gonna end up talking about this, I know there are so many people who are probably really bristling at the fact that I dumped o Oliver and it was the best picture winner. But I just didn't connect with it. And I I think more people I, are gonna know. be bristling that you didn't put 2001 on, but. People, people sorry, know who you are. I've never, yes, you've I've made never your heard case clear. <laughs> it's like it's like in my head. Every time you say the title of it, it censors you. It's just a beep. I don't even hear it. <laughs> oh my! Uh, I can't wait till we do our most overrated movies in history uh, series. Uh, I'll, I'll just need to change the tag on one of our previous conversations. It'll be great. Right. Super easy. Oh, you. Um, anyway, but I will say, as it, this is a. Um, you know, this is a uh, a series uh, that has, you know, a year certainly that has a lot of uh, appreciation by, you know, film lovers that, that is, is we've been heard a lot about the great year of 1968. It's one of the great years. And and I can see why. I mean, there was some really interesting work going on here. And I think, you know, films like Targets, uh, for me, really exemplify um you know, 
pushing boundaries and pushing limits um, uh, in this film. And Rachel Rachel in the same regard, like pushing some cultural buttons that that hadn't been heretofore been pushed. And and so I I really appreciate that we took the kind of long time to do this this major arc. Something that we didn't mention as we were just talking about this. Are there films from 1968? And I know you may not be prepared for this, but are there films from 1968 that we have not discussed that you also might consider as being more uh, likely to be one that should be recognized, should have been recognized? Um, that That is uh, actually a great question. And I you know, I still uh, look back at and I don't, I don't know off the top of my head what the o- award spread was for these movies that I still hold and appreciate from 1968. Uh, but uh, The Odd Couple is certainly there. Bullet is certainly there. Um, you know, we talked about Rosemary's Baby uh, last week, that that's probably a film that that, uh, you know, should uh, be recognized in this list that we haven't talked about. Absolutely. Um you know, I and so uh, what are some others that I haven't seen? Yours, mine, and ours is another one that I feel like uh, I've I've heard a lot about and I've never seen. And, and uh, then, of course, there are movies that I think are are right in the right place. Thomas Crown Affair is right in the right place. Feels like it's exactly it, it's as uh, noteworthy as it needs to be. Uh, Boston Strangler, Green Berets, um, those movies have their own kind of legacy uh, for film lovers. But in terms of movies that I think you know merit more attention certainly those are up there rosemary's baby is the big one we haven't discussed on the show that i would absolutely put up there um possibly even uh find something to replace and put that on my uh nominees for best picture because i think it's a mm-hmm. a, a pretty um strong film i don't know if there's any i honestly i haven't seen that many others um the odd couple i i saw so long ago honestly i just can't recall if I liked it that well. Um, so I don't know if I'd, I'd put it up on that list. Um, yeah. Well, and, and then what about, uh, I think guess who's coming to dinner was another one that was technically for the o- award season was 1967, but it's big run was 68. Is that right? Um, I'm not um, sure on that one because, uh, it's another one I haven't seen, believe it or not. And, but I think it was mm-hmm. 67 though. So it might've been yeah, like 67, December, and 67. The graduate is 67. Yeah, graduate too, 67 so, right. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I that's that's where I am. Okay. Well, it's it's that's interesting to that's look at. That's where we are. And and something yeah. else that we didn't discuss, um our, Franco Zeffirelli, um he's done quite a number of Shakespeare projects. Um so obviously Shakespeare is somebody that he connects with as far as the stories of Shakespeare. He did Hamlet with Mel Gibson in 1990, which is the big one that I know I've seen. Uh, yes. um, I really yeah. enjoyed that one. And actually, speaking of the grit, that one really did have the grit. Um, I liked that one quite a bit. Yep. Um, yep. He he did the very uh, famous version of The Taming of the Shrew with Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. That came out uh, the yep. year before this one. Um and then he did uh, Othello, I believe, but I, I don't know if that was a um, for theater or I mean, not for theater, a TV movie version um, or uh, for film. I think it was a theatrical release. Yeah, as I'm looking at it, it was a theatrical release. So um, I've only seen the version of Hamlet that he did, though. But you haven't seen Taming of the Shrew? I haven't. No. That's the one I was I was uh, going to say is the one you absolutely need to see because it's it, it is fantastic. And uh, again, if you don't like Shakespeare, if you're going in sort of counter Shakespeare, I think, you know, Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor are fantastic. Well, that's um, one that I like. I do you know, enjoy The Taming of the Shrew yeah. quite a bit. OK, yeah. so you've seen that one. Uh, Hamlet was great. And uh, the film is terrific of Taming of the Shrew. And so I, I think it's it's wonderful. And so, yeah, I mean, in terms of somebody who connects with Shakespeare, like I said, I mean, I, I think that I mean, he has a screen. Uh, play credit on this film and i think this is um likely his strength and contribution to the film that you know he knows how to tell a shakespeare story cinematically and he has a, a real sort of grasp of it um you know whatever you think of the story itself um you know if if you're a shakespeare lover this is a pretty good one yeah, uh, yeah. and and i think the you know absolutely those other two i i i really liked that you're you're right that the grit that i was asking for is probably hamlet that i'm thinking about <laughs> right um, yeah the very very in great fact film. That, that he just got it right then yeah um you know some 30 years later so that's it you ready to rank it yeah let's do it 
All right, head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel. You'll see all the movies we've talked about on this show. If you swipe over in your show notes, you can click on uh, Flickchart. It'll take you right over to this movie where you can add it to your list and see how it stacks up to ours. All right, first up, we have Romeo and Juliet or Fat City. I'm going to go with Fat City. How how hard? 100%. <laughs> really? Are we there? That's what we're doing? It's going to be like that. I Pete, can't. Yes. I can't. I can't. I, I I can't let it drop to this at bottom half. I, I'm okay with it in the middle, but I can't let it drop that far. I got to take you to the mat on that. One. Okay. I got to do my part. All right. Here All we right. go. One, One two, two, three. three. Paper. Rock. There we oh. go. Romeo and Juliet or Raise the Red Lantern. I will take Raise the Red Lantern, please. I will also take Raise the Red Lantern. Romeo and Juliet or Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance. I will go with Mr. Vengeance. I will go with Mr. Vengeance. Romeo and Juliet, or Sweeney Todd, the de- demon barber of Fleet Street. Sweeney Todd, I please. would go with Sweeney Todd. Romeo and Juliet, or High Noon. I'll take High Noon. I'll take High Noon. Romeo and Juliet, or Mad Max. Mad Max, please. <laughs> Mad Max, yes. <laughs> Which is, I, I, many people don't know, uh, loosely based on Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Romeo and Juliet, or Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Uh, oh Brother, yes. Oh Brother, indeed. Romeo and Juliet or Numi, the girl with the dragon tattoo. Numi. Yeah, I'll take the girl with the dragon tattoo. Uh, Romeo and Juliet or the lion in winter. I will take the lion in winter. I will also take the lion in winter. Oh, I wasn't expecting that. Well, that lands mm-hmm. Romeo and Juliet right in the middle of our chart. 193 out of 386. Andy, I got to tell you, that could not have gone better for me. I know. Or It's exactly what I wanted out of this what's funny is that is going to come up as a first ranking for quite a while now yep and for a it's, while. it's no I longer so our oh brother block it's going to be the romeo yeah. and juliet block <laughs> which for romeo me block. is going to be an easy choice almost every time <laughs> <laughs> well then it won't be there that long <laughs> hopefully not hopefully not uh, that's fantastic well how did it uh, how did it end up on your personal list it's a tough film for me it's a tough story shakespeare is tough anyway not saying something I'm going to return to often. It landed at 34.57 out of 4,082, which is a 15%. Andy, uh, for me, uh, this one ended up at 634 out of 1,055 uh, on my personal click chart. It was right between Jackass and Big Trouble in Little China, uh, if that gives you any sense of where. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's that really tells grim. me Big Trouble in Little China uh, is ranked way too low on yeah. your chart. <laughs> Uh, but it is, uh, that makes it a 40, a uh, 40%, 40 out of a uh, hundred. If I were to go by the algorithm, uh, that would be a two star film, um, uh, for me, which I think is too low. Uh, this is not, uh, this is not a four or five star film, but it is a solid three star film and I, I like it. I think they did good things with it. And, uh, so it's right in the middle of the road. Well, for me, it landed at two and a half with no like, well, I'm going to go ahead and inflate it with a like, with a heart. It's it's got a heart, three stars and a heart for me. Please. So that lands at two point seven five with a heart over on Letterboxd dot com. Yes, it does. There you go. Do you do two point seven five over there? Are you manipulating things? No, it it rounds up to three. But when I write that's it in I our mean, review, yeah. it'll still say two point seven five averaged. Oh, that's your passive aggressive. That's, that's exactly how I, I see. do that. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, that wraps on uh, up as we said a very long uh, and and glorious. Uh, dive into the films of 1968 and the films that came from it. Uh, but my goodness, Andy, where do we go from here? Well, this is a series you kind of snuck in on me. <laughs> I, I know I have yeah. said several times throughout this show that I've only seen the first Rocky film. Um, but for whatever reason, the last time that I said that, you decided it was a travesty and have now added the entire Rocky uh, uh, collection <laughs> To our list. So we are going to be talking about Rocky 1, Rocky 2, Rocky 3, Rocky 4, Rocky 5, Rocky Balboa, Creed, and Creed 2. That's right. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, I feel so good about this. Now, look, people, <laughs> I am not going to mix any mince any words here. I I understand the and appreciate that 1976's uh, Rocky is a classic. It absolutely is. Everything else after that. Uh, meets with some mixed reviews. I recognize that. I want you to know going in, I am generally 
a Rocky apologist. So you should know <laughs> that going in, it's, it's not going to be easy for Andy, likely, come the later films. It's, it might not be easy. I'm accepting that. It is about time that we have the Rocky films on our list. And there we go. Well, I think it's funny that we've done 1976 as a year that we've looked at before. Yes. But when we did that, we did not touch on Rocky. We did not do Rocky. No, I know. Plenty do you know why, films. Andy? Because you were because saving up for this. Yes. Yes. <laughs> this is why. And I don't know how I got so lucky that I got into the spreadsheet and was able to add these without you noticing for what felt like months. It was months. You didn't say it, anything. I didn't notice for months. It was a very I long time that, that it's out there without me. Ah. <laughs> uh, uh, so anyhow, oh, there you go. Boy, Rocky's oh boy. coming next week. I can't, can't wait. Well, if you want to hear more of us, but you can't wait until next week's show, check out our new show, The Marvel Movie Minute, that actually just went live last week. We're talking about the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe one minute at a time, starting with 2008's Iron Man. You can support that show and all of our shows over on Patreon.com slash The Next Reel, and you can get access to our exclusive members-only weekend show, The Saturday Matinee. We talk about movie news and new trailers, plus we go head-to-head in our weekly challenge in which we put together lists of movies related in some way to the movie we're talking about that week. There are all sorts of other goodies, too, if you support us at different levels. Just head on over to patreon.com slash the next reel. You can learn more about us and check out the detailed show notes at thenextreel.com. You can subscribe for free in your favorite podcast app and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter at The Next Reel. And if you want to get into the conversation yourself, join our Discord server for a whole lot of movie chat with movie lovers from around the world. You can find the link to join in the show notes or on the website. The Next Reel couldn't happen without the hard work of Stephen Smart running Instagram. Ben Lott, who runs all things Twitter. And thanks to Eli Catlin, who graciously allows us to use his song Ragtime Instrumental as the theme to the show. You can find out more about Eli on his SoundCloud page. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. Amazon giveth, Andy. Uh, it did. <laughs> and then we changed our minds. Psych, Amazon. <laughs> See ya. You know, I, I did what I sometimes do, which I head over to uh, commonsensemedia.org, which uh, often, for movies that I don't remember very well, provides a good baseline sort of general review of whether or not I should be watching this with my kids. Did you, did you check it out for Kingsman? After... <laughs> Doing this after I took my children to Kingsman, my child to Kingsman. Yes, Andy, you jerk. So there. Thanks for the memory. Uh, uh, I'm anyhow, always here for that one. I had this feeling that I should probably just peek at uh, Common Sense Media for this one because I couldn't remember if this is one of those uh, where there was some sexy, sexy stuff in it and that that was why it was super controversial. And so I did. I went over here and I read this. I did not at the time look at the kids' reviews of this movie i looked at the what parents say and uh we ended up as as you now know watching it together yes for this section of our conversation we have elected to choose some kids reviews about this movie uh in in uh, instead of doing amazon uh, we should do this like to... every time, really, because I, I kind of think we should. So These are better. fantastic. <laughs> oh, my God. They're so much better. Would um, you like to uh, take the uh, lead on this one? I will. I will. I'm reading a, a review, a five star review from a kid, 12 years old, who says it's for ages 13 and up and says it's very, very sad, sad, sad face. I saw this movie when I was nine with my mom. We both seemed to enjoy it. The ending was very sad, though. Well, at least we didn't cry. But then I watched it again, and I just couldn't stop my eyes from tearing at the end. It was impossible to stop the crying. Anyways, with a Z, there is violence, but not that graphic. Only swords, rarely daggers and knives, are used in fights. There's one brief male nudity, but not frontal, only backside. Lasts for about a minute, I don't know. We also see a young woman naked in bed, but she is mostly covered by a blanket, and her breasts were mostly covered by her hair. But then we see her nipple for less than one second. Trust me. This implied <laughs> they had sex last night. Adults drink alcohol. <laughs> oh, God. 
on. There you uh, go. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> trust me. I counted. It was definitely less than a second. Uh, oh, God, <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> How about this one from Jenny Penny, who's 15 years old with a five star saying she loved this movie. I love this movie, but I haven't seen the play yet. Romeo and Juliet is a story about teen about two teens that fall in love, but they cannot be together because they're from two different households. The Capulets and the Montagues, they despise each other and constantly get into fights. So Romeo and Juliet get married without their families knowing Things go wrong and some people die. Juliet is forced to marry a prince that her father has arranged. Juliet pretends to kill herself so that her and Romeo could be together. Romeo finds out that she's dead, but he did not know that she was pretending to be dead. So he ends up killing himself. And when Juliet wakes up, she notices that Romeo is dead and she stabs herself and they both die, which makes both sides of the family sad and realize they need to stop bickering and get along. I would say this movie is for mature teens that wouldn't call the movie done just because they killed themselves in the end. Cause <laughs> 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 dumb just because they killed themselves in the end. This title contains violence and scariness and sexy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I love this site so much. This is my Every new time place for ratings. This is gonna happen. This is gonna yep. happen. This is so it. Good. Thank you, common sense media.org. <laughs> you are the best. Here's the next real traffic. We love you. It is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great movies, so many great conversations, but it's a lot of work. Producing this show week after week does require a lot behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. We had some great films in Season 8 that started their lives as books or plays, and you can find all of them on our Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals. That's the site where listeners can find links to purchase all the source material behind the adapted films we covered from season one up through our current season. For part of season eight, we had a series celebrating the 50th anniversary of films from 1968. We talked about 2001 and 2010 for our Odyssey series, both adapted from Arthur C. Clarke's novels. Man, the second one was so much better than the first, right? Don't you even get me started. <sighs> Need I bring up Under the Cherry Moon again? Yes, also so much better. <laughs> wait, wait, no, that's not what I... <sighs> Planet of the Apes kicked off its series based on the novel by Pierre Boulet. We covered Danger Diabolic and The Detective, adapted from novels for our 1968 crime films. Wait, wasn't that The Detective the prequel to Die Hard? They were both written by Roderick Thorpe, and yes, it's the same character in the books. I can't believe they even asked Sinatra if he'd be in Die Hard. That would have been yeah. weird. <laughs> Uh, Once Upon a Time in America was part of our Leone Once Upon a Time trilogy, adapted from Harry Gray's novel. And we looked at 1968 Best Picture nominees The Lion in Winter, Rachel Rachel, Romeo and Juliet, and Oliver! We also had an Ingrid Bergman series with adaptations like Spellbound, For Whom the Bell Tolls, Murder on the Orient Express, and Gaslight. We haven't talked about Gaslight. Stop gaslighting me! <laughs> Dive deeper into these books and more adapted films at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every purchase supports the podcast. Get the full list of adaptations that we've covered on all the Next Real family of podcasts and start your next read today at thenextreel.com slash originals. Originals.